too seriously. We live in a rapidly changing world, and in a rapidly changing world, the facts of yesterday, the knowledge of yesterday, become irrelevant. So you might as well give up on that and take uh, the whole idea of uh, skills and take the whole idea of being psychologically flexible and, uh, and, and lean and, 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 and being able to interact with the world much more seriously. The other problem that we face, and this is something that is a, of direct concern to anybody who's got children, is this. Historically, education was very much about the transmission of values. It was, it was about conserving the values of the past, giving them a new meaning in the 21st century, and passing them on to the young, younger generation. This transmission ideal of education, which is something that everybody signed up to at one point, has been broken. So instead of transmitting knowledge from the past, the legacy of Western civilization, to young people, what we're trying to do is to alienate the younger generations from their past and teach them that everything that has gone on beforehand is ipso facto, by definition, inferior, morally inferior to what exists in the present. And that's a huge problem, because what it does is it creates a psychic distance between the generations and creates all kinds of problems which become increasingly more and more uh, difficult to resolve. It's actually led to what I called in my book on education, socialization in reverse. So rather than adults socializing the young, the teachers, the, the new pedagogy tells young people to socialize their parents and to teach parents to recycle or teach parents about good psychological values or to teach parents about the importance of understanding that there are millions of genders. So children then become the medium for socializing the old, which I think is a mega problem. And finally, there's a ver another issue, which uh, certainly as a father, uh, I'm really glad that my son has now grown up, so he's not really exposed to this, is the imperative towards indoctrinating children rather than educating children. The relentless process whereby young people are confronted with a politicized curriculum and not only confronted with a politicized curriculum that teaches them essentially the dogmas that are in fashion, but particularly teaches them to be ashamed of where they come from. It teaches them to be ashamed of their past. It teaches them to be ashamed of their civilization. It guilt trips them and tries to make children feel bad about who they are and where they, where, you know, where they are. And worse still, and we're seeing this, and I'm sure that Penny will be talking about this, uh, it, it creates a situation where young children become confused about whether they're girls or boys, become confused about their identities, and we're creating a massive mega-identity crisis which is manufactured within the classroom. So these are all things to kind of bear in mind. Uh, tonight, we have a nice transatlantic exchange of opinion, of experience, which is quite important, and I look forward to our American colleagues telling about their experiences and our European ones about you know, what we are going through. And I see this as the first step in a series of discussions that are going to occur um, because one of our, uh, our big ambitions is in February next year, we're going to organize a long uh, two-day conference involving educators from, from throughout Europe where we're trying to create a, a network of, of serious teachers and educators who take these ideas that we stand for more seriously in order to push back against the prevailing doctrine that is being pushed uh, often from, by Brussels itself because the European Union, uh, the, the bureaucracy and the bureaucracy here is trying to homogenize the educational uh, sort of experience throughout Europe. So this will be the first of a number of a many, many uh, discussions. And what we have is a, is a, is a, is a number of uh, experts uh, from heritage uh, sort of foundation in America and then uh, here from uh, Europe. The way we'll conduct the discussion is that everybody will speak, the four speakers, they will each speak for uh, 10 minutes. Uh, the first speaker will be Mike Gonzalez from, from Heritage. And he's the, uh, um, uh, uh, I can never pronounce this properly. This is too long. Yeah. I'm a senior fellow. He's a, he's a senior fellow. He's also a nice guy. He's, he happens to be coincidentally, accidentally, one of the first 
guys that ever commissioned me to write for Wall Street Journal when I was still very young, you know, sort of. Um, so my whole journalistic career is probably thanks to him. And when he, when he left the Wall Street Journal, he joined the Bush, Bush administration where, where he worked. And, uh, you know, he's written a book, which I would suggest people have a look at, called BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. It was published by Encounter uh, back in 2021. So, Mark, if you could start us off. Ten minutes. No more. Thank you, Frank. Frank, Frank has emphasized the ten minutes so much that I'm actually going to find myself. I'm not watching my son play baseball back in Maryland. Um, Frank, uh, Frank was very young when I commissioned him 30 years ago. I was right, it was right after my first communion. So, um, I, <laughs> Frank, I set up really, really well with the things he said. I do want to push back a little bit on what he said, that these are American. European ambassadors meet with me a lot in Washington. They say, stop importing these things to us. And I have to say to them, yes, but, you know, George Lukacs was not American. We imported Lukacs' ideas on how to teach depravity to children. Um, we imported Gramsci's ideas, and just as Lukacs was Hungarian, Gramsci was Italian, on, on the fact that there's no truth, but there's only a in a, a hegemonic narrative. And then we also uh, imported not just his ideas, but we, imp we imported him himself in person, Herbert Marcuse, who was also not American in, in birth, but German. And he was the one that actually did both those things. He wrote Errors in Civilization, which he went on at length as saying, well, you should just have free sex. And he was very clear in the book in 1955, you know, in, in deep, boring Eisenhower America, saying that you, we want this because it will destroy the family. And, and then he had One Dimensional Men in 1964, in which One Dimensional Men said yeah, Americans were just dumb boors. Uh, the, European, the American worker was even worse than the European worker. He would not start revolution. And then this all led to pedagogy. Frank talked about pedagogy because the book that is most often used in schools of ed is Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, who is a Gramscian. And it's not really about pedagogy. It's about how to create revolution in the United States. Um, so yes, we're exporting, and I apologize for that, we're exporting all these bad things, but what we did is just, we imported them from you, we added value, which means that we added race, which we were, we're obsessed with, and we added, uh, we added things like transsexualism, and then we said, here, you have to push this, and in places like Hungary, where we have a clown ambassador who's pushing really this thing so super hard, uh, it's, it's, you know, no, we should never be treating an ally in this form. Uh, so. Anyway, let me, uh, yes, education has become a main battlefield, and you, there's a good reason for that. And you, the, the way I talk about this often, and I talk about this maybe once or twice a week, is that we're not doing normal politics in America. We're doing regime politics. You know, normal politics is talking about the top marginal tax rate, which I did a lot when I was an editor of the Wall Street Journal. I used to edit copies, commission cop uh, pieces on that, or agricultural, you know, uh, policy towards Canada. No, we're, we're really discussing and debating now the, the Constitution of the United States, both with the Cap C, but also how we're constituted as a country. And regime politics leads to a lot of instability and a lot of noise. So a lot of, so a lot of my European friends are constantly texting me saying, Mike, are you going to have civil war? And I always say, no, this is a political process. It's going to be solved politically. Uh, it, it does generate a lot of noise because it's re regime politics. And education is the new battlefield because, uh, in, and I should say that I'm one of, the, well, everybody at Heritage works for Lindsay uh, Burke, uh, Burke, but I don't actually report to her, or I'm not supposed to. I am actually in the foreign policy field, but because I do a lot of cultural politics, I work, I have the, the, the joy and the, 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 the honor of working with Lindsay a lot because education is so caught up in this. Schools, K through 12 and, 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 and universities is where a worldview is transmitted, where we transmit a worldview, and that's what makes it such a battlefield. Uh, now, I believe that neither side, and, and, and Frank alluded to this, neither side should shrink from that idea, the fact that this is where we transmit values. And I think in my country, both sides pretend that's not the case. The left says, no, we're just interested in, in, in evidence-based ideas. We're not, we don't really want to transmit an ideology. But a lot of my conservative friends also want to pretend that we also want a market, a, a place a, where, where all ideas compete. Um, and I think this is, I think conservatives, I don't care what the left does, I'm a conservative, 
conservatives should be disabused of this notion. We should really, uh, you know, be serious about the fact that it's schools is where we pass our culture, our habits, our morris, our collective memory. It is not tabula rasa, nor should it be. Um, now, the left, it's hard to say that it is an ideology that it's teaching. It's more like an, a counter narrative. That's what they would say, themselves call it. Actually, behind it is collectivism, it's, it's anti capitalism, but they actually never say that. They, they find all sorts of uh, euphemisms like diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is not, it's, it's the opposite of what this word is supposed to mean. Um, but at the, at the bottom of it is to teach children, my children, in this case, I have skin in the game. I have two children in college and one in, in ninth grade, about to, about to enter high school, uh, that uh, America is structurally, institutionally, and systemically racist and oppressive. And if you believe that, then logically what we have to do is dismantle all the structures, the institutions, and the system itself, right? The system is just a Greek word for the way everything works. And what they want is total transformation. This is something that has been a constant for Marxists since Marx himself. Marx, you know, his favorite line was from Goethe, everything that exists should be abolished. Um, so, and this is something that every leftist has had. They want to dismantle all of society. We, what we say when we're, when we're saying things correctly is, look, we have racists in our midst. Uh, we're not unique in that sense. You know, every society has racists. We have also rapists and murderers. We have to, be, to get serious about that. We have to have laws. And in the U.S., we have very good civil rights laws to deal with racists. But we need to, while we uh, prosecute people who break the law uh, by, by committing racist acts that are illegal, uh, we should not dismantle the system. As, as, as problematic as the U.S. is, the U.S. system is pretty good. I happen to be an immigrant. I have lived at least a year in seven countries. I used to be a foreign correspondent. I know where I'm able to compare and contrast, and I think the United, the United States, even today, with all the problems that we have, is a pretty good going concern. We shouldn't just throw it out. Um, I want to uh, want to accelerate ahead because Frank is looking at me, and I know I only have four minutes to go. So uh, once we ha well, once this transformation is is accomplished, the strategy is to reprogram the American brain with uh, redistribution, DEI, ESG. And eventually reparations, but but really what it is is about a transfer of power. And if you read the left as much as I do, they're very serious about power. They they mention power. Alinsky talks. I think I I did a, a, a word search in his book uh, Rules for Cat Radicals. I think he mentions the word power seventy five times. Alicia Garza's title book, her last book, is about power. It powers in its title, and they they say, well, no, this is about bringing in people of color, being inclusive, people of color. But that's not really what they mean, because if you have a person of color like Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, they reject him, and they're very mean about him. And it's the same thing with Thomas Sowell. Uh, so, so it really is about ideas. And, and in fact, they want to be inclusive and bring in white allies uh, who agree. So what it is is about power and an ideology. Um, what we have seen in the U.S. is because of 2020, uh, the fact that we had committed Marxists who used the very tragic death of George Floyd uh, to, to really try to deliver a knockout blow. They had spent seven years trying to, to deprogram the United States and reprogram it, and the media went along with them. Uh, you saw a, a huge uptick in the mentions of white supremacy and all that since the creation of uh, BLM. Uh, and then with 2020, we, we saw a very violence, a lot of violence. But the American people and, and the institutions all said, yes, we agree. Uh, we agree that, that we're systemically racist. We need to overthrow the system. The American people said no. And, 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 and it happened in schools. It was the moms who fought against this. It was the moms who really got in the way of this. Moms and dads. But it really, if you travel the country, and I, this year not so much, but the, the, the two previous years I traveled to maybe 30 American cities. And I mean all over the map. It, it, I really met with moms and grandmoms. You know, some fathers, but it was really, and in fact, to, to go back to Gramsci, Gramsci was right when he said that the, stir, the sturdy institutions of civil society would prevent revolution. And that's what you're seeing in America. And it's a school level thing. This has put political pressure uh, on, uh, on, on, on the states because this is going to be a state by state battle. Lindsay Burke will tell you she will never let school be, be run by the federal government. This is the, the state. 
I, I like to say it's the natural sovereign of education. Lindsay will say, no, the family is the natural sovereign of education. So yeah, you train me well. Um, uh, so, but, but it is really at the state level, and the, and the moms and the, and the dads pushed Yunkin. You may have heard of Yunkin, but Yunkin didn't want to do this. Yunkin was very reluctant to embrace the moms and the dads, but, and he was losing as late as August, and then he realized, I'm going to lose this race. He fired his consultants, and he hired new ones, and he won. He won, and today he has like a 57% approval rating in a state that's bluish to purple. Ron DeSantis... Nobody wins by 20 percentage points. He won by 20 percentage points because he did what the moms and the dads did. You've heard this noise. It's generating a lot of noise. It's going in the right direction. I'm very optimistic. Frank, I'm, I'm, I'm over 10 minutes, but I'm going to leave it now. But I'm, I, I, I tell you that even though I cannot predict what's going to happen next year in the presidential elections, because there's a lot, of different, a lot of different variables that go into who will be elected, it could be very easily that Joe Biden is reelected again. There is definitely a shift. America is turning hard against DEI. America is turning hard against critical race theory. Lindsay will explain to you what critical race theory is. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Andrea Scaloni, who I, I first met in Rome at a conference at a teacher's union. And he's written a book, which I really uh, suggest you have a look at, called Knowledge Society a new paradigm in the sociology of knowledge. Uh, uh, I think we share a very common commitment to classical education, uh, but I'd love to hear from you on the Italian experience. Okay. Thank you, Frank, for uh, this opportunity. Thank you all. Uh, I want to tell you just three things. So the first one is my personal experience. The second is uh, what is going on with um, the standardization from EU uh, policies, uh, mainly on the uh, what I call the knowledge chain, from education to innovation, not only research. And the last point is about indoctrination to youngsters. Uh, my personal experience, uh, my lyceum, classical lyceum, uh, also. Um, my father, but now also uh, my son, my daughter uh, already got his degree, her degree. Uh, uh, we uh, studied uh, Greek, Latin, and this seems to be uh, uh, old fashioned uh, education. After this, uh, I enrolled uh, in physics. I got a degree in theoretical physics. After that, I w I've been working for six years in high-tech industries. Uh, and then, since uh, 30 years ago, uh, I tried to understand something uh, is going on uh, in Europe. Uh, so I'm a sociologist of knowledge. Why it matters? Because now in Italy, we have uh, uh, the so-called School 4.0 project inside the National Plan for Recovery and Resilience. We are speaking about 18 billion euros. Uh, on this line, uh, on the line, uh, over 2 billion euros for doing what? We have a lot of problems uh, with uh, buildings, with uh, uh, teacher underpaid uh, all over uh, every uh, classification in Europe, uh, our uh, are the uh, low paid teachers, um, low uh, services, etc. No, two uh, two uh, problem, two projects. The first one, I read. Please don't laugh. Development of the digital profession of the future in a classical lyceum that uh, Liceo Albertelli students should acquire experts in video making, digital music producers, curation manager, curates new releases in playlists, digital curator, social media manager, social media editor, digital media curator, and so on. The other one, 
Next generation classroom is even worse. Try to imagine it's not easy. Uh, it envisages the purchase of digital boards, tablets, printers, also 3D printers, a classical lesson, Greek, in order to transform classrooms into hybrid learning environments. This new setup should cascade into organizational, didactic, curricular, methodological innovation that adapt to the speed of communication that uh, characterize our society, etc., etc. What's going on? Against our tradition, um, we are speaking, sorry, uh, Italian tradition uh, uh, is uh, one of the most varied traditions uh, uh, tradition in Europe because we have been having uh, one of the biggest socialist and also communist traditions, uh, Catholic church uh, tradition, liberal tradition, um, not speaking about uh, humanism, renaissance, uh, illuminism, and the other renaissance uh, during the uh, last uh, one century and a half. Okay, destroying class group. This is the typical uh, setup of our uh, making school uh, with uh, a community of pupils and youngsters and also uh, the university and teachers together all together, the extraction class group, fragmentation of disciplines across different programs, projects, on which the teacher uh, is going to uh, uh, lose uh, its, his um, autonomy, stated by uh, the article of the Constitution, Italian Constitution, the 33, that states that uh, teaching science is free. Eh? Free uh, means you, know, you can teach whatever you want, but inside the discipline and uh, the concourse you, uh, you want, uh, you can, uh, as a teacher, you can choose the contents and also the methods. Mm? But both are going to be erased. Uh, the long-term education uh, is uh, sacrificed to the uh, immediate re uh, requests, uh, pretended requests from the actual market, pretended as a, a, a bureaucrat in the ministry understand that will be the uh, future requests to which uh, a pupil uh, in the elementary school, uh, on a high school, uh, we have to, to meet uh, during his uh, life. Uh, the, uh, a technology-driven teaching will be, um, uh, not probably, of course, uh, uh, substituting the uh, all the traditions in uh, Italian schooling. Uh, the teacher will be reduced to a, a tutor. The term is not by, by chance. A tutor to the uh, machine. He will be uh, a, um, an assistant of the machine. Visors, 3D visors, or what else. The second point that comes uh, up, two more minutes. Yeah, naturally, is the standardization, because uh, lowering the power uh, of the teacher uh, requests an enhancement of uh, something else external in Italy, private uh, uh, agencies, uh, companies to evaluate. Uh, without a pedagogical background, a scientific background, but just with uh, its own uh, logics. 
So the standardization means that uh, the uh, constitutional uh, freedom uh, guaranteed to the teacher will be without any effect in the uh, growing up of our chi children. The last point is indoctrination. Uh, just one thing, I want to read you for you uh, the tests, uh, baby PISA named, that are uh, going to be uh, supplied to uh, pupils from six to 10 years. I will achieve the educational qualification I want. I will always have enough money to live on. I will be able to do what I want in life. I will be able to buy the things I want. I will find a good job. The only thing that you are going to do is to uh, scrutinize families. Uh, you can also only uh, know something about the social level, uh, the driving forces within family, not in the pupil. From a pedagogical point of view, uh, the result is irrelevant, but uh, this uh, supplying is nefast. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, uh, we now have Dr. Lindsay Berg, who's the uh, the, the maven of education at Heritage, as far as I can see. What I'm excited about, I don't know if, she, if she's gonna talk about it, is that you seem to have some kind of relationship with Glenn Youngkin. <laughs> and <laughs> we in England, when I was there, were really excited about what happened in Virginia. Yeah. So you might be able to reflect on that a bit. Yes, well, thank you, Frank, and thanks to MCC for having us here from Heritage. Really happy to talk to you this afternoon. Great to be here. I was appointed by Governor Youngkin last year now to serve on a uh, university board, the board of visitors at George Mason University, which is the largest public institution in Virginia. So that's been a great experience. I second everything Mike has said. It's really been uh, phenomenal to see the success that he's had in Virginia and what that uh, portends for the future. But so that I don't break a promise Mike gave you, I will give you a quick overview of critical race theory and how we see that uh, defined today. Basically, CRT holds three main tenets, that there is no truth, that there are only competing narratives or perspectives, that your, quote, lived experience matters more than facts. That's the first tenet. The second is that you are either an oppressor or oppressed, and that is a designation that is predetermined by immutable characteristics such as skin color. And then finally, CRT holds that America must be dismantled because it is systemically racist and because it is based on an economic system, capitalism, that leads to inequalities. What do you think, Mike? Perfect. So that is, I think, uh, CRT in a nutshell. <laughs> and this has made its way and has long been housed in particular within colleges of education, within universities throughout the United States. And Mike isn't wrong that it is, has been largely imported from Europe, but that makes me optimistic uh, that in our exporting of potentially a worse version of CRT, that we will also export uh, to Europe what we are seeing unfold today in the US, which is this wonderful expansion of education freedom in the state and education empowerment of families. So that's what I wanna talk to you, but just quickly on the problems that we're facing today. Mike mentioned pedagogy of the oppressed. This is the third most assigned textbook in colleges of education across the country. We know that there is a rampant growth in diversity, equity, and inclusion faculty in universities across the country. My colleague Jay Green has outlined exactly how rampant that is, that these are individuals in universities that aren't leading to a more welcoming school climate uh, at these institutions, that they are there to really enforce a political orthodoxy. And what is particularly unfortunate right now is that we are seeing that same DEI structure, infrastructure, make its way down into K-12 elementary and secondary schools across the country in the United States. That exact same system, but in K-12 schools known as chief diversity officers, uh, as Jay has also found. 
uh, we now see that in about 80 percent of large school districts across the United States, they employ a chief diversity officer. And so they're replicating these bad practices that we have seen unfold in the university system in order to make sure that particular political orthodoxies are enforced. And that is because, to um, underscore something that Mike mentioned a second ago, these are not, these chief diversity officers, these DEI, uh, what did you say, Jay Commissariat, are not neutral actors. These, and neither are public schools neutral in the values that they transmit to students. They are transmitting a particular worldview. And these worldviews that public schools are espousing aren't neutral. And so the question really becomes something that Jay brought up a little while ago, which is who will raise children and shape their values? And the reason we are seeing such an expansion of education freedom in the states in the U.S. is because the answer among parents has resoundingly been that they will, that it is their children for whom they are responsible and that they are their children's first and foremost educators. This is a paradigm shift. For a hundred years in the U.S., we have placed trust in experts when it comes to the education of children. And what COVID demonstrated, what parents saw when the curtain was unveiled through virtual online lo learning, when schools shut their doors long after we knew that it was safe for them to reopen in-person instruction, what that did was it broke faith with families across the country. And that laid the groundwork for this massive expansion of choice across the country. And so in 2020, we saw this paradigm shift happen in a significant way. We can go back through the history of choice. You probably know somewhat the history of education choice in the U.S., but as I'm sure you know, that groundwork was really laid by Milton Friedman. It was his 1955 essay, The Role of Government in Schools, that really did put out that intellectual framework for the school voucher movement. And it would, I say, really remain an academic argument until the 1990s. So for 40 years or so, sort of remained in that, uh, in that article form until we saw a few states throughout the country adopt school voucher models, tax credit scholarship options, where basically instead of assigning a student to a public school based on where their family could afford to buy a home, the state said you can have a portion of the money that would have been spent on your child and you can go to private school. And so we saw the modern day school voucher program slowly expand throughout the 1990s. And then we saw it tick up a little more in the 2000s. Well, in 2011, we saw something significant happen. And that was based again on something that Milton Friedman articulated. Milton Friedman was still thinking about school choice all the way in 2006. He gave an interview to an industry publication known as Education Next. And he said in that interview, well, what if you could do part of your education at one school, take part of your voucher to another school, maybe do French in one school, math in another, why not partial vouchers? And that laid the groundwork for what became known as education savings accounts. And Arizona, the state of Arizona in 2011, became the first state to adopt this new model of education choice. And so in Arizona now, every single child, if they want, can receive an education savings account, an ESA, literally with their name on a debit card. So the money that would have been spent in a public school, that money goes onto a debit card with the kid's name on it that the parent has in her wallet. And at that point, they can spend that money on a private school if they want, private school tuition. They can hire a private tutor. They can do online learning. They can use it for special education services and therapies. They can buy textbooks, curricula. They can even roll over unused funds year after year. They can even roll it into a college savings account if they want. This is a completely different way of thinking about how to finance K-12 education. Instead of assigning a kid to a school, we're gonna give you the money that would have been spent on them on that debit card, and you as a parent, as their first and foremost educator who knows your child better than anybody else, can decide exactly what that education looks like. So for some kids, they don't even enter a brick and mortar school at all. They take their ESA, they might hire a private tutor, buy textbooks and curricula, do a completely customized a la carte education for their child. So that was Arizona in 2011. And we had Arizona, Florida followed in 2014, couple of other states. But this year, just this year, we have had six states adopt universal, sorry, seven education savings accounts. Every single child in those states can now receive an ESA. That is why we really think this is a watershed moment for education choice. 
that a policy idea that was relatively new, 2011, is now universally available to every single family, regardless of income, regardless of any other test that you might put on a choice program, they have access to it. So this is really a huge shift in how we think about financing, about how we think, about who is ultimately responsible for the education of a child. And so hopefully, over the next few years, we will see that exported to many more states across the country, and hopefully we'll see it exported overseas as well. But it has, uh, and we can talk more about it, really just been a huge benefit to the participating families. And more important than anything else, it has allowed this critical values alignment where parents have been supremely unhappy with the content of public schools, with the outcomes of the learning that their children are receiving in public schools, with whether or not those schools are even open, with whether or not they are safe and effective. Now, if they want, they can access that money and they can select an institution or any sort of a la carte option that fits their needs <coughs> and aligns with their values and ultimately, ultimately the hopes and aspirations of their children. So, that's up there. That's great. Great, great timing, Wendy. Uh, Penny Lewis is from Scotland, and she's the editor for the Scottish Union of Education. The only time in my life I was ever cancelled <laughs> was going up to uh, the meeting in Scotland, which Penny organized, and discovering that I went to the wrong place because it was shut. <laughs> but that was an interesting experience. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with two snapshots. <clears throat> One was a meeting that we had last week, the Scottish Union of Education, actually in the same venue that a church that had kindly set, stepped in to allow us to um, get Frank to speak when our, our venue was cancelled. There were about 85 people. We couldn't end the meeting. There were so many parents that wanted to speak about the negative experience that they had had, particularly in relation to the teaching of gender in schools. There were a number of parents that spoke saying that they had primary school children who had come home extremely confused. One girl, because she liked playing football and she had deemed from what the teacher said that um, the instruction that she'd got meant that she was probably trans because as a girl she was conforming to a male stereotype. And another woman whose child was transitioning and clearly she felt that process of, of transitioning had been something that had been led by the school uh, and at the moment in Scotland it's perfectly legal and the advice suggests that parents um, should not be consulted by schools um, in situations where it's deemed that um, there may be a threat to the child uh, if the parents get involved in the discussion of transitioning. That's one experience. The other experience is that a local paper ran a story just as I was coming away, um, celebrating the fact that Lesbian, Gay, Trans, Youth Scotland <coughs> had managed to um, award to the first primary school in Scotland an LGBT charter. And uh, this story was talking about how the fact that they've formed an equities committee within the school for nine ch primary school children, um, some of who, who had families who were LBGT, had formed this committee to review the development of school policies and as a consequence of that uh, they had demonstrated that they were able to to get this silver charter. The report says there was a roof raising rendition of This Is Me which is a song that had been developed particularly to celebrate difference and then there was a 400 person rainbow flag created and photographed at the end of the day. The deputy head said that the appointment of uh, the award of this of this charter marked a cultural shift and that all parents uh, all teachers including non-teaching uh, all staff including non-teaching teachers had been uh, had undergone LGBT awareness training the local councillor said he was as proud as punch because Dundee was leading the way in terms of the country it cost something between 1000 and 1500 pounds for the primary school to go through uh, the procedures that are involved in this charter status. This is in one of the most deprived areas of, of Scotland. This money comes directly out of uh, school funds. So that's a snapshot of the situation we're in at the moment. Um, how, how did we get there? That's a much more difficult thing to describe. 
and what do we do about it? That's something that the Scottish Union of Education is just starting uh, to find out. Um, but just as a little bit of background, um, not sure how much you know about Scottish education, but at least historically it was seen as being internationally good. It was admired. It was seen as being a very positive uh, part of Scottish culture. Um, there are many newspaper editors that were trained within the Scottish education system in London, even now. Uh, so until recently, it was well ahead of the OECD program uh, management PISA, uh, which assesses the performance of students at 15 years old. Uh, uh, but uh, very recently, in the last few years, um, Scotland has been falling behind on that performance indicator. In fact, the last report was so negative that the Scottish Government tried to prevent its publication by using uh, national interest uh, claims. <coughs> the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy um, records that the attainment levels in Scotland on reading and mathematics for primary school children and early secondary school children have declined significantly since 2011. We don't, we can't give a full explanation of the cause of this, but we can identify education reform that took place in about 2010 as part of the problem. That education reform was called the Curriculum for Excellence. It was based on the idea that education should be child-centred, which was seen as an alternative um, to the English ethos that was developed by the Conservatives in the 1980s. We were told that teachers would be given autonomy, which also was a sort of critique of something that was going on in England. And most importantly, we were told that the curriculum would be concerned um, with curriculum knowledge and um, application of knowledge, uh, not abstract propositions, which is quite an important idea, the idea that knowledge is something that must be applied for it to be um, real. The strap line of the curriculum of excellence was successful learners, competent individuals, responsible citizens, and effective uh, contributors. They sound like nice words, but I was a parent with primary school children when this was introduced, and they were very instrumental in the way that they were discussed. And they were written in a language that meant very little uh, to most parents, but seemed to be a language that was shared between the political class and educators. When my kids brought home reports, I couldn't read them. I'm a university lecturer. I couldn't make sense of them because they talked about things like uh, students being secure in relation to an educational level rather than actually telling me what the mark was. This started to be a discussion uh, which was in acronyms. We were talking about GERFEC or SHINARI, which mean nothing to you, but they meant nothing to most parents in <coughs> Scotland. GERFEC means getting it right for every child. SHINARI, I'll tell you what SHINARI means. It means safe, healthy, achieving, nurtured, active, respected, responsible, included. This was now the criteria on which um, schools were expected to make judgments about the quality of their education and, and monitor the outputs. <coughs> and constantly, these kind of, um, this kind of language was affirmed <coughs> uh, and discussed with our kids to such an extent that I think even my own kids who were a little bit resilient to this because both parents were not keen on it, did start to see education as something that was about risk management and affirmation uh, rather than about the transfer of knowledge uh, and the development of themselves as individuals. Often when you talk to young teachers, um, they assumed that nurtured and included, which were two key points in the Shinari indicators, was something that conflicted with achievement. And if as a parent, you suggested that achievement was something that you were very concerned about for your child. You were told that you were a helicopter parent or a tiger mum. Uh, that was in 2010. Since then, things haven't got better, I'm afraid. Uh, in 2014, the Scottish Government, within the context of Gurfit and Shinari, suggested that we needed legislation which introduced a named person for every child. This was an individual probably located within the school who would take personal responsibility for your children. After a passionate campaign by Christians, old school social workers, left libertarians, and many conservatives, uh, we managed to push back on this idea. And the Supreme Court ruling decided that the name person raised serious concerns about information sharing, privacy, 
and the and the right to a family right <coughs> to a family life. So that was the situation uh, when we hit uh, COVID. Pre-COVID, uh, the Scottish government had issued a questionnaire to children with very explicit questions about both um, anal and oral sex that included children uh, throughout uh, secondary school. And it seemed uh, that parents had started to wake up to the idea that the discussion of sex education in schools uh, was One more minute, Penny. problematic. But during COVID, many p parents started to notice explicit and confusing material appearing in, in the learning materials that students shared. This kind of awakening to what was going on coincided with the Scottish Government's gender recognition reform legislation, which you may have seen also provoked some kind of reaction among ordinary uh, people and has proved to be particularly unpopular. But it, at the same time, the Scottish Government were pushing forward on a new curriculum on relationship, health, sex and parenthood. Sue has um, been a mechanism through which parents have started to report on all of the ways in which this new uh, sex education curriculum uh, is really creating a great deal of confusion uh, and trouble uh, for many young people in Scottish society. It takes place in a context in which it's increasingly the case that teachers are encouraged to see their role as guiding the individual in their private life rather than promoting the idea of knowledge and self-development and achievement. And I suppose a lot of these problems stem from the curriculum reform that took place in, in, in 2010, um, but they're really compounded by a situation in which par parents are terrified by the fact that teachers don't seem to understand where the boundaries are between parent responsibility uh, and the responsibility uh, of the schools. Um, we've just could produced. You, could you wind up now? Okay. We've just produced a pamphlet, um, and it's been highly successful, which is really uh, putting the arguments to, to to parents how they can go to their school and argue against uh, the increasingly politicised dominance of uh, gender-based education. Thanks very much, Penny. <laughs> so, uh, what we'll do now is I'll, I'm just going to ask a question from all of our speakers. And then um, we'll take it out to the floor and hear your views and then get the speakers to get back on that. I want to begin with Mike. And the question I have is something that, uh, is a, for me, it's a bit of a beef with American conservatives, which is why is it that uh, American conservatives are fairly strong relative to many parts of Europe? For some reason, they're not very keen on getting their children to become teachers. I'm just wondering why that is and whether you inherited or doing anything to drive to make sure that the teachers in schools uh, reflect the values that they believe in. Because I think that every time I go to America, I, I find it to be the biggest problem uh, on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I, that's perhaps a better question for Lindsay. I, uh, but I, I tell you one thing about American conservatives is, yes, we are – healthy relative to, to many European countries, not Hungary, where I think conservatism is actually, an ex I expect, I hope, not expect, I hope that in some ways Western Europe is hung Hungarianized, um, in many ways, not in all ways. Um, I do think that we start out, we have a position of advantage in that we actually are, are set up, and we're not a, a complete creedal nation, that's, a, that's an exaggeration to say America is solely a creedal nation, but we are based on two things, natural law and natural right, to a much greater degree than even our closest allies. Uh, and, and obviously natural law, which be, which is a, a deep belief in eternal truth and truths that are either divine, you don't have to be religious, I happen to be, but or, or in nature is the opposite of critical race theory, Gramscianism and all that, which is a belief that it is only a conceptual superstructure. <laughs> I think, and I really want to lead this aspect to Lindsay because I, I want to go back to the 19th century and the creation of the common schools where I think that from my perspective, the common schools did a lot of good in assimilating European immigrants, especially the big groups of Irish and Germans and Swedes 
that started coming in in the 1840s. And then after the Mexican-American War, they moved to the West and did the same thing with Mexican-Americans. But I know that Lindsay will say this, that there was a lot of problems also with the common schools. Uh, I, I tend to emphasize the positive, perhaps too much. But you're right that there is a – we don't teach our children to be uh, teachers. I have three of them. I have tried my darnest to get them to go to law school, and they all three of them said, absolutely not. We want to be happy, and none of your <laughs> lawyer friends are ever happy. So <laughs> – um, uh, but but I don't, I, I've given you as 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 good. You're, you're right, and I don't know the answer as to why. I know why we're. Uh, by the way, we also have. We've also made huge mistakes, American conservatives. We have we allowed the culture to be taken over. It's a fair criticism when young conservatives come up to me and say, "On your watch, Mr. Gonzalez, all the institutions, the the, the Hollywood media, they they were all taken over by the left. Why are you still here?" <laughs> And I, it's, 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 you know, it's, and I, I have explanations. We were getting wise to this in the in the nineteen nineties, and then nine eleven happened, and everybody migrated to, to do that, to to try to fight Islamofascists, uh, or Islamism, and and we took our eye off the ball. But that's just a, you know, so we, so it's not we're not completely healthy as conservatives. We have a lot of, of, of we have to, a lot of work and reform that we still need to do. Yeah, uh, I think we might get back to that point. Since you mentioned Lindsay, mm. um, so Mike has praised the common schools, which I think <laughs> was not a bad idea, mm -hmm. except they got screwed up by John Dewey, mm -hmm. who actually <laughs> came before <laughs> Lukács <laughs> and came before Gramsci. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, just a, a different point of a pedagogy. But given the fact that the common schools have certain merit, how do you reconcile that with uh, your mm -hmm. emphasis on choice? Yeah. Because what choice does is it has got the potential for breaking down the uh, the bonds that children from the same generation mm -hmm. have and creating a very polarized, potentially quite a polarized cultural environment. So I just... Yeah, I had a feeling that was going to be your question. So, and Mike, I think you got a lot of that right. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I do think you put a little too much credit into the, the common schools. And look, Frank, I think this begs the question that the current system is actually accomplishing that goal. If we look at our national assessments, the NAEP, uh, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, we assess civics outcomes in the U.S. and they are in the single digits at best. Um, so public schools aren't doing a good job uh, teaching civics. Private schools, by contrast, are doing a much better job. And private schools, because of their design, they are intentional communities and they do foster a sense of community. It's just not a sense of community that's necessarily based on zip code. It's one based on other factors that a family decides to prioritize that is, is values based. Um, on the, if I could just step back to the teaching question real quick. I th there could be a couple, and I'm sure there are many explanations for why conservatives don't enter the profession. I think they probably do see it, at least schools of education and colleges, as hostile to their, their values. They are, I think, colleges of education, the most left-leaning institutions within the most left-leaning institutions in America. And so it is difficult to be a, a conservative student in a college of ed, so that probably explains part of it. You know, there's probably something to, at the end of the day, teaching in a public institution means being a public employee. Maybe there's some natural reticence there. Um, but I'm optimistic that we're seeing this, this sort of break apart in a way that will encourage more conservatives to get in the profession. We're seeing non-traditional routes to teacher certification start to, I wouldn't say proliferate, but take hold uh, in certain areas across the country that allows you to bypass going through a traditional university-based college of education. Some state leaders are thinking about going even farther and eliminating teacher certification requirements altogether which would be a huge benefit because we know empirically there is no relationship between having a certification that you obtained through a college of ed and your ability to pr improve student learning outcomes. So, you know, I think we're starting to see some uh, chipping away at the traditional model, which hopefully will lead to more conservatives entering the profession. Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, Lindsay raises a very important point, certainly for me, which is that traditionally I am for the common school because mm. I do believe in... Uh, uh, educating uh, a cohort of generation together. But given the fact that the school system has become so corrupted mm -hmm. uh, and is so, uh, you know, it's so s has got such an evil dimension mm -hmm. to it, I'm all for heterogeneity mm -hmm. and for experimentation. 
uh, probably Europeans don't understand how lucky Americans are in one respect, which is that in America the school system is not federally run, mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore when you have uh, 51 states, or how many states you got these mm -hmm. days, it gives you a tremendous... <laughs> Just 50. Just 50. Yeah. I Obama said it. Yeah. Right, so I think uh, he did. Yeah, well, <laughs> over I, whenever I talk to Obama, we talk about <laughs> what, hap what happened to the other six. You know, the, um, but anyway, so it means that, you know, like in Virginia or yeah. a particular state, you can, you can uh, achieve great results uh, in a way that is in, in Britain is not possible. Mm. And you also have local school boards, mm -hmm. which don't exist in Europe, which then allow parents to put the kind of pressure mm -hmm. on that are impossible within the European context. I wanted to ask you a question, which is, uh, do you think that it's possible to hold the line? I mean, you talked about classical education. You talked about the fact that you left your whole family and you wanted your children to learn Greek and Latin. And I spent a lot of time in Italy, and I'm very impressed, very jealous of the fact that you still got uh, quite a bit of that left. Do you think that it's possible to have a future for that, given the kind of pressures you're getting from Brussels? in terms of uh, homogenizing the education system? No. That's a very quick answer. <laughs> if these policies were, and will go on uh, as they are uh, during the last 20 years, uh, especially during the last two, two three years, no. Uh, it is not possible. Because um, there is also uh, a mass campaign uh, on the media uh, against uh, these old-fashioned things are uh, dead languages. Mm? Uh, instead of this, uh, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, etc. Uh, it is um, a, a tragedy. Right. Also because uh, we don't have uh, any industry in these sectors. So uh, it is also, it's only uh, um, manpower that has to go, have to go abroad. Thanks very much. Uh, Penny, can you say a little bit more about, um, from your experience, whether it, do you think it's possible in a place like Scotland to emulate some of the successes that Lindsay was alluding to? and Mark was alluding to earlier on, in terms of being able to mobilize parents. Uh, because historically, uh, from my, I, I know that certainly in England, whenever a parent tries to find out what's in the curriculum, <laughs> uh, so sometimes they get taken to the courts on the ground that they're being toxic and they're kind of uh, <laughs> somehow bullying the teachers and all the rest of that. We haven't got the same kind of uh, opportunity to expose the curriculum. So I'm just wondering to what extent what you're doing can have a, gain any momentum and make a political impact, particularly given the, the fragile uh, political regime that the Scott Nash party has at the moment. Is, I mean, is this an opportunity to do what happened in Virginia, just in Scotland? I, th I think it is an opportunity, and one of the things that parents have started to do is to take their children out of um, relationship, health and sexual parenthood classes, RSHP. Um, so parents are taking, uh, going to the school, asking to see the curriculum with a varied response. Sometimes they're told they can't see the curriculum. Sometimes they're shown that they are, can see materials and they can persuade um, teachers to respond to them but quite a lot of parents are just lifting their children from those classes which they're legitimately allowed to do under Scottish law because it says that it's written into Scottish law that parents have responsibility for educating their children so that's one campaign but you've got to be quite a brave parent to do that and so we're kind of starting with little steps of private meetings online and then private meetings face to face and then public meetings. But already we've started to get a framework going in a local area. The problem that we have is that um, there isn't any political institution through which you could, so school boards, we have something called the parent council, but it's a zombie structure that serves no purpose. So I think people will have to use their counselors and the absenting of their kids is probably the main mechanism. And then we're trying to create a framework where these things get discussed because people are f scared of discussing them in public. 
maybe you should set up a political party. Yeah, that's a possibility. <laughs> okay, at this point, um, we could uh, continue the conversation because we have some very good speakers here. But I'd like to give you an opportunity, if you've got any questions to the speakers, uh, any kind of points you would like to raise, this is your chance to uh, make your views felt. Young man over there. Have you got Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Cornelis Schild, teaching at the Free University of Brussels, uh, professor in history and philosophy of knowledge. Um, Dutch. Yes, uh, has to be said. Um, in my home country, teaching is very badly paid. And teachers make long hours, in particular secondary school teachers, 60, 70, 80 hours a week with very little payment. So it takes a certain kind of person to take on a job like that. And I'm not talking about masochists. Um, it also takes a certain kind of father or mother to push your child to go for such a job that pays relatively little when there are so many other jobs around. You mentioned the fact that you said your three kids ideally should go to law school. I wonder if that has something to do with payment. Now, there is a saying in English, of course, uh, put your money where your mouth is. I think we've basically left uh, schools to the commies by creating a situation in which they thrive because it creates a power imbalance that they really love because now they can play victim. And I wonder um, if we want to address this properly, then one thing that we should go for in terms of policies is by raising salaries of primary and secondary school teachers and assistant professors in particular as well. <laughs> but uh, and I'm not an assistant professor. I'm, I've passed that stage already, don't worry. Um, by maybe as much as 100% to make it attractive. So just, just a comment that I would like you to comment on. Lindsay wants to go first. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> uh, yes, however, it's got to be based on merit. And at least in the US right now, the way that, and it's probably similar here, but it's step and in pay increases. So your increase in salary as a teacher is based on your served, not on how effective you were during your time in the classroom. And so what we have thought through is a proposal where you would pay a teacher six figures based on merit. However, you dramatically increase class size. And this is where, you know, we'll get pushback from unions and everybody else. But right now in the US, our class size on average is 15 to one. It's low, far lower than a lot of people realize that's a high school class size. And so if you were willing to increase that to say 30 students in a classroom, which is reasonable, you hire a uh, college graduate fresh out of college to serve as sort of the classroom manager. You pay a low salary to that person who just left school or even while they're in college still. And then you pay that master teacher much, much more, again, based on merit. Uh, that I think is the way that you get there. Also, we need to be willing, and I don't know how it is uh, here across Europe, but we have to be willing to move poor performers out of the classroom, which we have been unwilling to do. Uh, and you know that we put up huge barriers to entry to get into the classroom. We make you go to a college of ed, get certified, et cetera, et cetera, spend 40 grand on a master's degree that we know is utterly useless while you get indoctrinated in CRT. So knock down that barrier to entry allow any professional with a um, you know, degree in the subject matter area they want to teach to teach, but then evaluate them once they're in the classroom. And if they're not performing effectively, move them along. So actually in my case, it's not what you thought. I, it's actually I have great respect for the law. I do think that corre if, if, if correctly practiced is the, the word of God. And I think, and both my, my, my father and my mother were lawyers, you know, my father said we go back, we were lawyers to the 1700s. So I do feel like a, a special responsibility for stepping out. But this is another point more, and I don't know, you didn't mention this, Lindsay, but I saw a study last week, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, that when you factor in pensions, and when you factor in two months of, of, of work, of being off, yeah. you actually, you get more money as a yeah. teacher than you do as, as a lawyer. Jay, am I right about this, this study? I don't know about a lawyer. No. <laughs> Yeah. That a lot of occupations, so it actually equalizes. They, they're constantly complaining about how badly they're paid. Yeah, could you go to the chair? This is not a 
behind but here. this, I, I think, <laughs> I think in the U.S. at least, and the study was last week, done last week. When you factor in, I don't have a pension. Very few professions have a pension today. They do. Yeah. They guaranteed. And with the longevity in the U.S. right now, that could be twenty years. You and and on them. average, when you leave, you get a pay a pay cut. Oh, switch Can I just say one thing? I think your uh, premise is wrong because uh, there is a, a pay issue. But historically, if you look at good educational systems, they were based on teachers for whom teaching was a vocation mm -hmm. rather than a job. And the minute you turn that into entirely a market-driven profession, then you lose sight of the vocation aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And you end up in a situation, and there are many countries in Europe Canada is also another example where the pay is relatively high. Even in England, the pay is relatively high. But if you have teachers who regard what they're doing in the classroom in the way if, as if they were hairdressers, mm -hmm. you know, working in a hairdressing shop, then basically uh, you have a problem. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, unless we gain back the whole idea of vocation, we, we, we are going to have a, a lot of difficulties. And when I raise the problem about conservatives, not taking uh, teaching seriously. I was particularly worried about the fact that a lot of conservative guys I, I talked to do not understand that teaching is a, is a vocation if it's going to really work and, and, and kind of see it in terms of uh, pennies and pounds rather than anything else. But anyway, that's my view. Are, would you like to come back on any of these questions? Penny? Yeah, I, I think the other thing is that the barrier to people being good teachers at the moment seems to be this obsession with the, the self-esteem of the child and this idea of the child-centered nexus for the education. So it, even if we paid staff well, until we find a way to challenge that idea and start yeah, yeah. to really celebrate subject specialisms for secondary school, there are large parts of Scotland where there are no physics teachers, no maths teachers, because we've not celebrated the capacity to impart the knowledge to other kids and then just not being recruited. So I think it's more complex than just money, although money might be good as well. I agree for Italy. For Italy, uh, that's a big problem. But another big problem that perhaps is more general than only in Italy is about the number of students per class. Because uh, lowering the number of students uh, let the teacher um, direct the methods and also the contents more easily, gaining results, so also enhancing the motivation of the teacher. So I agree with the the payment, uh, it depends uh, on different countries, but also the number. Also because uh, children now are more complex than in, in precedent generations. So um, they need uh, a, a teaching more uh, tailored on them. Yeah, that's something we're going to discuss in February. Uh, I mean, the jury is out on class size, whether it's big or small. I, I don't think that's a black and white question. But in February, we'll be, that's one of the questions we'll be looking at. Mm. Uh, any other questions or points people are raised? Yeah. Um, I'd like to give a contribution on the issue uh, this man raised uh, in Belgium, because I'm a Belgian and uh, was uh, we studied the engineering here, and I come from another country, France, and I know I uh, can compare a bit. Um, the point of the salary is, is maybe true, but the main thing I noticed is, uh, through my experience, is that in, in sciences, at least, no teacher has ever applied science in his or her life. And they teach something they do not understand completely. Economics is the same, or business. I'm um, teaching myself, tutoring, uh, children from uh, wealthy families on business because they ask for not a teacher but they ask for a consultant, a business consultant. And I can tell you something, almost 100% of teachers teaching math, uh, 
science of course, but also economics and business, have never ever worked in a company. Secondly, ever, ever try to build, to set up a company. And they teach how to set up a company, how to run it. This is ridiculous. And this is Belgium. I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other points from the audience that people want to raise? Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Frank. Uh, up until February, uh, I was a teacher of maths in the UK. I taught in one of the best uh, grammar schools in Kent, and I also taught in further education in a very demanding, uh, rundown area. And so this discussion about teachers is very interesting to me. And the thing that hasn't been mentioned is teacher autonomy. So in both situations, I experienced a lack of autonomy. There was not the trust in the teacher. So it's very interesting you know, hearing, Penny, your points about parents' campaigns. And I think you might have some teachers involved in your group. Very interested to know. Um, so I think the, the pushback from parents is fantastic. But what you have at the moment is a situation where indoctrination is happening to teachers too. <clears throat> they're getting pulled into training sessions where they're told to check their white privilege. Mm -hmm. They're being told that if they <clears throat> don't affirm students' identity, they, they could lose their job. Um, so there's, I think there's, a, and there's not been, in my uh, experience, a great deal of pushback from the teaching profession if anything, slightly the opposite. So just very keen to hear uh, any thoughts about teacher autonomy, uh, how that's been undermined. And I think, Andrea, you mentioned about the technological side of it, bringing, you know, making the teacher more of a facilitator than a source of uh, knowledge. Um, but I think that teacher autonomy thing needs to be addressed. Any other points from the audience? That, any other points from the audience that people want to raise? If not, anyone want to comment on any of this? If, if I could on the autonomy, I would imagine that explains at least a part of why individuals are willing to teach in private schools for a lower salary than they typically get on average in public schools. They have more autonomy uh, in private schools potentially than publics. Um, something else you alluded to, so I, th I think a lot of teachers are tired of all of the indoctrination that they have to go through, to your point. No teacher likes getting signed up or mandated to do professional development classes, which are increasingly leftist. Uh, and so providing teachers with both autonomy and air cover to push back against some of this stuff in the classroom is really important as well. It's something, again, we, keep, we should just pull Jay up here, but something that Jay Green's worked on on our team is uh, a model bill that we think does provide autonomy in one particular area. And that's something that's called the Given Name Act. And this is ju was just developed this year. Uh, our friend Max Eden over at another think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, conceptualized it. We turned it into a model bill at Heritage. And now several states, including Arkansas, where Jay is, so we'll give him full credit, seven, uh, have now adopted it in law. And it is what it sounds like, the Given Name Act. A teacher or staff member cannot call a child by a name other than the name on that child's birth certificate or related pronoun absent written parental consent. So you cannot start any sort of social transition of a child in the school setting without a parent consenting to it in writing. It's a really elegant bill yeah. and we think it stops that social transition that could ultimately lead to surgical transition down the road in its tracks. But I think it's something that gives teachers air cover, at least in that one small, small area uh, that they're looking for. Jay, do you want to come in on this and explain yeah. a little bit more? Oh, well, just on, on, on oh, get a microphone. Sure. On this issue of uh, gender ideology in schools, which Penny uh, was talking about uh, uh, in Scotland, it, this is quite a big issue in the United States. and. Um, and we are looking for various ways to push back on it. The Given Name Act is one of our main tools. Um, it's extremely hard politically to oppose because it forces um, those opposed to it to say, schools should keep secrets from parents. Mm -hmm. This is a remarkably unpopular position to force politicians to take. Um, and, uh, and so this kind of bill is passing pretty rapidly. Um, and we also think that, that Social transition is a necessary precursor to medical transition. And without the social tr transition facilitated in school, we're not going to see as much medical transition. Um, my impression is that gender ideology seems to follow a lot of characteristics of other teenage crazes, primarily among adolescent girls, uh, like eating disorders and cutting. Um, 
the difference being that in the past when these crazes swept through groups of adolescent girls, um, the adults would band together and see this as a problem where they should coordinate to intervene to address underlying mental health issues, while um, uh, now it's seen as an expression of one's true identity uh, requiring affirmation or risk suicide of the child. And, um, and so we're, we're essentially seeing um, if this were eating disorders, um, the, the schools being compelled to say, way to go being your uh, um, skeletal self. Um, and this, this is not a very um, healthy thing for adolescent girls. So um, I think we can, can, these crazes can burn themselves out, and they can burn themselves out if the adults don't facilitate and instead coordinate. And given name act is an important way to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that ship has passed, unfortunately. The the trans phenomenon is so powerful now, and the parents... I think we can push it back and win. Well, I'm, I hope you're right. We can... Happy to put my 50 pounds against your one pound. <laughs> I, in terms of, but you're on. Yeah, <laughs> good. Um, we've got nine minutes left. I, I want to pose a question uh, about something that I feel very strongly about. About 15 years ago, I had a discussion with Michael Gove, who was then the Secretary of Education in England. And Michael asked me, what was the one thing I would do to save education or to improve education. And I basically said, either close down all teacher training colleges mm -hmm. or alternatively build new ones. Yeah. All right. And uh, I thought, because it seems to me, unless you hit that kind of confront the problem mm -hmm. at the level of teachers training, we're never going to uh, succeed. Just want to know what your views are on that. Kind of Actually, th what I was going to say goes ex ex exactly to that. But I, I had also couple conversations with Michael Gove. He was a huge fan of E.D. Hirsch, Thank by the way. Yeah. <laughs> we we uh, don't dislike E.D. <laughs> Hirsch. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, going back to Frank's question and answering yours, you know, the teachers that I talk to, a lot of them are not, some of them are, are ideologues, right? But a lot of them are just good people who have been converted in school. So a lot of them have, have say to me things like, look, I think that cultural responsive teaching is a good, cultural responsive teaching is the idea you can only thrive if you're being taught by somebody of your own race or your own ethnicity. And I said, that sounds like this is what they taught me at schools of education, and that makes sense to me. It's common sense. And then you say to them, you understand that if we follow you to the logical conclusion, we have to have complete segregation. We have to go back to school segregation in the United States. If you can only be taught by your race, then – and they're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought through that one. So – I think that you're right. I think the schools of ed had, are doing a, a horrible job. They're taking people who are not ideologues and teaching them this stuff who are receptive to it because they want to be good. Mm. Any other views on this? Okay. Well, in, in, in Scotland last year, the General Teaching Council, which is responsible for validating all um, university courses and all teachers, um, put out a framework of a new ethics for teaching which included that you must – promote social justice agendas and so you can't actually qualify as a teacher now in Scotland without adopting a whole range of ideology so I think we have to start again actually we, can, work yeah. mm -hmm. uh, we have to work yeah. outside the existing framework because it's so strongly institutionalized in Scotland anyway and there's no opposition in Scotland either right can, uh, uh, sure. just, can I just say we have a, haven't got that much time can I ask all the speakers to indicate what is the one thing they would like to see happen uh, in the short term, not in the long term, uh, to improve the matters, to kind of confront the problems that we're dealing with? Okay, can we begin with you, Andy? <laughs> uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the main problem is to open up education to a pluralistic approach, guaranteeing different uh, cultural heritages. Uh, in Italy, uh, we have three, four, or maybe more uh, uh, traditions that are equally uh, worth uh, for uh, education. And this is the, the worst uh, damage uh, that um, will be paid um, in Italy on the long run. I'll leave ESAs to Lindsay, and I'll say short term, uh, the reintroduction. I feel I take a pick a bone slightly with you. The reintroduction of classical education 
and that's not a whole gamut of things. That bas that's basically Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem, uh, and and and, uh, and of great books. I think it's very doable. Not Budapest. <laughs> <laughs> and Budapest, sorry. Yeah. Yes, Athens, Rome, Jerusalem, and Budapest. Yeah. Yeah, universal school choice, universal education savings accounts, every single kid choosing if they want, they could select into a classical school, but uh, breaking the monopoly that is the K-12 education system. And then while we're breaking monopolies, eliminate teacher certification requirements, which would also cut the legs out from under colleges of education. That was two things, sorry. Uh, I'll give you. Okay. The most immediate thing which Sue is trying to campaign for at the moment is that Scottish schools stop inviting campaign and activist organizations mm -hmm. into schools to teach kids about gender ideology and that's our most immediate aim and if we could push back on that I think parents would realize that they have got a role in terms of demanding that we don't have indoctrination in schools. Thank you. Well, thank you very much all of you. Um, look, this is the beginning of a conversation and I'm certain that we're going to be able to make quite a big impact in Brussels because the Brussels bureaucracy is very reluctant to engage with these kinds of issues. They would rather that this was just treated as a technical procedural matter rather than as uh, the substantive issues <coughs> to do with European civilization and the necessity of uh, nourishing that and bring that forward. Uh, just so that you know, we have a very exciting set of uh, events coming up between now and February when we're gonna have a big education conference. So there's two dates for your diary. One is on, after a long, beautiful summer, on the 18th of September, we're gonna have a session on the politicization of museums, the way in which museums have been taken over and subordinated to the most uh, disgusting political values such as decolonization and all the rest of that. We're going to have a, a manifesto that we're launching on the 18th. It's called a, a conservative manifesto for saving the museums. And I hope that uh, you know, as many of you as possible will have a chance to come along to that. But then, and this you gotta put in your diary, we're having a very uh, day and a half long conference on the 28th of September. And that's going to look at the question of identity politics, multiculturalism within the European Union. It's called the European Union from Christian democracy to identity politics, why? And we're gonna explore why is it that the European Union has decided to main, mainstream identity politics and internalize that. And we're not just gonna explore it, but try to find ways and means of pushing back against it so that we can project an alternative al uh, sort of narrative within the European context that can challenge this whole uh, remorseless march towards the uh, institutionalization of identity. Stay around, we've got some food to you can pick on and some drinks. <laughs> And I'm glad you were able to come. Could you give a hand to our speakers who were really, really excellent tonight?